So here we are in La Coruña in Spain and it's a little bit nippy today so I've got my coat on but uh, it's really really sunny so I uh, can't really see. <laughs> Should have put my sunglasses on. So this is the main square and this is what I remember the most about La Coruña. So this big nice big grand uh, crunch to the buildings. Well, as per usual on this cruise, we managed to find a cafe. We can have a cafe con leche and use the Wi Fi. What have I just been teaching you, Cathy? <laughs> cycle of fifths. So, that's it. And what was the cycle of fifths? Can you remember? Oh my god. A, B. No, F. F. There's a D and a G. F, C, G, D. F, C, G, D, A, E, B. That's right. Day 13 and we're in La Coruña in Spain, so we've only got one more day, another sea day and we're home. Sailing at 2 o'clock, so we've just had a morning here and uh, it's been really nice, just had a little mooch around in town, visited one of the cafes, had a coffee and just had a look at a few of the shops. We bumped into a couple of passengers in town and they were talking about uh, about Fred Olsen cruises and about the difference between Fred Olsen and like some of the other cruise lines that they've been on. We got talking about the difference between big boats and small boats. In the big scheme of things, Balmoral is a pretty small boat. It's not even mid-size. I mean, at one point it would have been a mid-sized kind of ship, but these days with the huge oasis of the seas and things like that, all the big Royal Caribbean ships, it's, uh, you know, it's pretty small now. I think Balmoral's 48,000 tons and it's supposed to be pretty much the same dimensions as the Titanic. So you can get an idea from that. You know, you always look at the old uh, footage of Titanic or the film and you think, oh, that must have been a huge ship, you know. But uh, when you actually compare it with modern cruise lines, it was pretty small. It's not uncommon now to have ships well over 100,000 tons. It used to be, you know, quite rare. There were things like Voyager of the Seas, one of the Royal Caribbean ships, I think that was 120,000 tons. And then you got the Queen Mary 2 that came out. It was like, 150,000 tons and now you know they're up to 200,000 tons and more so uh, that's usually the Royal Caribbean ships. As with everything, bigger's not always better. So if you were to look at something like the Berlitz Guide, which is a, uh, a popular guidebook uh, working through ev pretty much every cruise, uh, cruise ship there is, um, they rank them you know, with the star rating. And most of the high star kind of boutique ships are usually very small. You know, you'll get things like Seaborn and like Silver Seas ships, some of those things, some of the Hapag Lloyd ships, they're very, very small. They're more like super yachts. I mean, they're, they're not yachts, but they're, uh, you know, if if you were to compare them with some of the really big yachts, they don't really look that much bigger. They cater to pretty much what you would label an upper class kind of market. The bigger cruise lines with the bigger ships like Royal Caribbean, Carnival, NCL, P&O, etc. They pretty much uh, cater to a mass market, you know, so you'll get a lot of the cheaper cruises on there. You can get really good deals and things like that. And it's, uh, it's not the traditional kind of cruise experience that you would have got in, let's say, you know, pre pre 1990 let's say or pre-1980 it's um you know, they're, they're catering to a huge mass market. On those ships, you're likely to get a lot of children and teenagers, and there's a lot of things on there for, uh, you know, to keep them occupied. So you might have a lot of playstations on there, and there's a lot there's a lot of activities for them. On a bigger ship, you're also likely to get a lot of things like ice rinks and water slides, and, you know, just a whole host of different things that you're just not going to get on smaller ships. Fred Olsen Cruisers kind of falls between those two categories. So they're fairly smallish ships, but they're not really in that boutique market. So uh, they're just smaller ships, but they, they really aim for a certain market, and it's usually for the older generation. So, uh, you know, the, those and Saga cruisers, they, they often get a lot of the older age range. A lot of the people that would find, let's say, a Royal Caribbean ship really exciting would probably be bored out of their minds on, on a ship like this. I've worked on both types of ships, and I don't mind either. I quite like this kind of environment because it's very laid back. So for doing a two-week cruise like this, you know, it's, it's just a bit of a chill out and it's very relaxing. Um, I think if I was on for a long, long period of time, and I have done longer stints on here, um, it, it can get a little bit boring, but what you have to do is really take it for what it is. So the, one of the upsides to, uh, to Fred Olsen Cruises in uh, particular is that the itineraries are really good. So 
if you're likely to do a world cruise or even any of the uh, any of the sort of mid-season kind of cruises and go around the Med, um, you'll get very varied itineraries and you get to go to places that you might not ever get to go to on some of the bigger cruise lines. Even though I've spent a lot more time on the bigger ships, I think during the two or three years that I spent on uh, on Balmoral, I probably saw more ports, uh, more different ports than all the other years that I've spent on bigger ships combined. Of course, one of the upsides to working on some of the bigger ships and the bigger cruise lines is that you're generally going to have a very thriving crew social community. You know, there's going to be a big crew bar, there's going to be a lot of different activities, there might be a crew club, and there's a lot of things that the crew do together. And, um, you know, you forge a lot of long term relationships with people on there. For crew, it's generally a lot more fun on some of the bigger ships. A great example of that is like I mentioned in one of the previous vlogs, when we were in Kenya for three days, we all managed to go on safari. And that was something that was organized through the crew club and we managed to get a load of us together. I mean, there was all of our band, we had a six piece band. There was um, all the uh, dancers, all the theater company, a lot of people from different areas on the ship. And we had a great couple of days out in Zabo Valley, you know, going and checking out giraffes and you know, whatnot. <laughs> When the crew organise these kind of trips, you can get some really, really good deals, you know, so the crew uh, club maybe might organise it through the ship and, and get in touch with some tour operators and, you know, you just get these really good deals. Another big difference with working on a big cruise line is the type of gig. So if you're working in the theatre, let's say, if you're playing in the theatre band, the theatres can be huge, you know, the, like I've shown already, the, the theatre on here. It's not really a theatre, it's just a cabaret lounge, it's very small, there's just, you know, not that many seats. It's not what you would call a theatre, even though it is kind of labelled as such. Whereas on the, on the bigger ships, you have these huge big theatres, you know, it it's a theatre. You'll also have a lot of different venues on board, so there might be a separate cabaret lounge, you might have a lot of different bars, and it's a lot of different places for the acts to play. So you'll have like pia uh, piano entertainers, you'll have duos, trios, several bands sometimes, you know, and you, and you distribute it amongst all these different venues, so it's very, very different. And the type of music that you play in those bars is, uh, you know, it's going to be determined by the type of people in there. So it's going to be very, very different. Like on here, back in the, uh, in the Lido lounge that we play in, it's a very subdued kind of bar. Yeah, there's a dance floor and we do get it, uh, you know, we do fill the dance floor sometimes, but the majority of it, because of the age range, is going to be ballroom music, easy listening, you know, 60s music possibly, maybe moving up to 70s, but you're not really going to get away with playing a lot of, let's say, rock music or, or stuff like modern day kind of things. The shows in the theatres on bigger ships are going to be written to accommodate those bigger venues, so there's a lot more glitz and glamour, you know, the show it's pretty much kind of West End sort of Broadway kind of musical things. The size of the theatre also obviously dictates the size of the band in there. So on a very small ship, you might only have a four or five piece band uh, backing various shows or, or visiting artists, whereas on a bigger ship, it's going to be in excess of eight piece. One thing I have noticed with this, you know, this difference between bigger and smaller ships is that when you're working on board on the uh, on the bigger ships, you're more likely to get a lot of kind of politics involved. So there's a lot of red tape. There's a lot of you know filling out forms and a lot of rules and regulations and you don't get that to the same extent on smaller ships so on here everything's kind of laid back there's no real pressure whereas on some of the bigger lines you just feel like you're under the microscope all the time and that's you know you're always being watched and everything's being logged and you're always you're always under pressure from some department so from a working standpoint I would say there's pros and cons for both big and small ships working on a bigger ship and a bigger cruise line can be a lot of fun but working on a smaller ship like this and smaller cruise line it's a little bit more chilled out and laid back so here we are sailing away from uh, La Coruña our final port and next stop Southampton Well, here's one thing that you're always going to need on a ship on a formal night, a tuxedo. So